Connecticut Paid Leave and Connecticut FMLA, how they apply to your business and some tools for human resources professionals to use. Just a quick introduction of myself and Kathy. My name is Jessica Vargas. I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer here at the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. I have been in communications and broadcast media for the past 15 years. And I'm a lifelong Connecticut resident with the exception of four years that I spent in Texas uh, while I was earning my bachelor's degree in advertising and in Spanish. Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Mihailuk and I am the business process lead here at Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Prior to starting at Connecticut Paid Leave, I worked in uh, human resources in corporate America for about 20 years. I have a bachelor's in business from Sacred Heart University and a master's in communication arts from the College of New Rochelle. And I look forward to the presentation and speaking with everyone today. Thanks, Kathy. So a quick overview of our agenda. We're going to, of course, talk about the Connecticut Paid Leave Program, and we're also going to do a quick comparison of FMLA and Connecticut Paid Leave, um, as they are two different laws, but they're very much intertwined. We're going to talk about implementing the Connecticut Paid Leave Act, the coordination of Connecticut Paid Leave benefits with employer-provided PTO, implementing Connecticut FMLA, which we'll see some significant changes come January 2022. And then we will leave you with some additional resources. And as Amber mentioned, we'll have time for Q&A at the end as well. So first, let's give you a bit of an overview about the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. So the Paid Leave Authority is a quasi-public agency that oversees the Paid Leave Program. Uh, we have five sort of key areas of responsibility. The first being outreach and engagement. So making sure everyone who's impacted by Connecticut paid leave, um, be that employers, employees, healthcare professionals uh, are aware of what the program is about and what their obligations are under the program. We develop the policies and procedures needed to run the program. We establish the trust fund contribution rate and receive contributions. Um, the, the, the maximum rate um, is set by the statute. So we are not able to raise it. We do approve and audit private plans for those businesses that would like to uh, elect their own private plan, um, insurance plan, instead of participating in the state plan. And come January 1st, working with our third party claims provider, AFLAC, we'll be administering claims for paid leave benefits. Let's review the timeline, just go over some key dates. So uh, just about a year ago, end of November of last year, employer registration opened. Employers were to begin deducting half of 1% from their employee paychecks starting on January 1st. And those um, payments are remitted quarterly to the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. There is a 30 day grace period. So for example, Q1 um, contributions were due by April 30th and so on. In February, we started accepting private plan applications. And in a few short weeks on December 1st, we'll be opening our, um, our claims portal. So folks who know of an upcoming event that they would like to apply for paid leave benefits for will be able to start submitting their applications. And then of course, on January 1st, um, benefits become available and we'll begin to pay out benefits for approved claims. Let's start with talking about who is covered and who is not covered by the Connecticut Paid Leave Program. So uh, covered businesses include employers who have more one or more people working in Connecticut. And this does include nonprofits as well as private sector employers with a unionized workforce. Now, sole proprietors are not obligated to participate in this program, but they may choose to opt in if they would like to. Um, if they do choose to opt in, they have to stay in the program for a minimum of three years. The one uh, sort of important thing to know is that a sole proprietor who has employees, even if he or she chooses not to opt into the program for him or herself, they do need to withhold those deductions um, for their employees. Now we do have some exceptions as far as who's not covered by the program, and that includes employees of the federal government, uh, unionized employees of the state of Connecticut, except for covered public employees, which we'll talk about in just a moment municipalities and local or regional boards of ed, um, again, unless they have covered public employees, and non-public elementary or secondary schools are also not covered. 
Then there are a few other exclusions, and these are exempted as a result of other laws. So that includes railroad workers, individuals employed by the government of another state. So um, for example, if someone is a Connecticut resident, but they work for the state government of Massachusetts, they would not be covered. Employees of sovereign nations are not covered. Um, which does include employees at Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. Employees engaged in interstate commerce who work in Connecticut but live in another state are not covered. And finally, spouses of active duty military members who continue to pay taxes in their home state instead of the state where their spouse is currently deployed are also not covered. Now, I mentioned covered public employees. So um, non-unionized employees of the state of Connecticut are covered by the public Connecticut paid leave plan. Uh, unionized employees of the state of Connecticut who collectively bargain to be included in the program are also covered. And then for municipalities and um, state and, excuse me, local and regional boards of ed, um, if the unionized employees collectively bargain to be included, then all employees, both union and non-union are covered by the program. Let's talk about the contributions. So as I mentioned, when we were looking at the timeline slide, the contributions began in January of this year. The contribution rate is one half of 1%. And that is uh, based on post-tax wages and calculated um, based on the wages for FICA. The contributions are capped at the social security contribution limit, which is currently just shy of $143,000. And that makes the maximum contribution amount per year for someone earning $142,800 or more, $714. So the employer takes that deduction from the employee paycheck. They remit it to us quarterly. And we then receive uh, the contributions and validate the information based on DOL data. The contributions are deposited into the paid leave trust fund and the paid leave trust fund is the fund from which we will pay benefits starting in January. Let's do a quick uh, review and comparison of FMLA versus Connecticut paid leave. So um, FMLA is probably something that you're very familiar with. FMLA provides job protection. It's the Family and Medical Leave Act, and there's both a federal law and a state of Connecticut law. And both laws allow eligible employees to take job protected time away from work for certain family and medical reasons. Both laws also state that the leave is unpaid. So employers may adopt policies for income replacement, but they're not required to under FMLA. So for example, some employers will continue to um, pay while their employees are on leave, the most common example of that is probably paid maternity leave. And many employers do require or permit their employees to use any of their accrual. So their sick leave, vacation leave, or any other kind of PTO. But as I mentioned, there are some pretty significant changes coming in January 2022 that will um, affect FMLA. So on this chart, we look at the differences between FMLA as it stands today and FMLA as it will be um, in just about six weeks or so. So currently, Connecticut FMLA applies to businesses with 75 or more employees. That will change to one or more employees starting in January. So we know there are a lot of smaller businesses who have not had to um, ever deal with FMLA leave before that now are going to need to learn about it. The second change is that currently employees must have worked for at least 12 months for the employer. Those can be non-consecutive months and they must have worked at least a thousand hours during the 12 months immediately before their leave. Uh, coming in 2022, there will no longer be any hours worked requirement and the job protection will kick in after three months of employment instead of 12 months of employment. Then we have some changes in terms of the length of leave. So currently up to 16 weeks of leave are available in a 24 month period and 26 weeks of leave um, in a 12 month period for military caregiver leave. That is changing. So there will be up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period for all leave reasons. Um, the military caregiver leave will remain the same up to 26 weeks. And a new addition uh, is an additional two weeks of leave may be available for incapacitation during pregnancy. Another significant change that you want to be aware of is that currently employers can require their employees to use all of their accrued PTO while they're on leave. Starting next year, 
You can still require your employees to use their accrued PTO, but you must allow them to retain up to two weeks to be used at a future time. So for example, if um, someone knows they're gonna have to go out on leave for four weeks based on their doctor's um, diagnosis, and they have four weeks of PTO saved up, you can require them to use two, but the other two you have to let them uh, retain for future use. Now what's Connecticut paid leave? So Connecticut paid leave provides income replacement for the time that folks might take away from work due to certain qualifying health and family reasons. So again, they are two separate, they're two separate laws, but as you can see, it's pretty difficult to talk about one without the other. And when you hear us say CTPL, we, we use it to refer to the statute itself, so the Connecticut Paid Leave Act, the program, and ourselves at the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority as the agency. Um, the law creates a source of income replacement benefits for eligible employees who cannot work for certain family and medical reasons, and it does not provide job protection. So it is possible to, to qualify for CT paid leave, but not FMLA or vice versa, depending on the situation. And you may also hear it referred to as PFML or paid family and medical leave. So what are the reasons that someone can apply for leave or uh, apply to receive Connecticut paid leave benefits? Medical leave is the first reason. So that's leave taken to care for someone's own serious health condition. And it does include serving as an organ or bone marrow donor and pregnancy. Then we have bonding leave. So bonding leave is leave that an employee would take to bond with a new child that's entered their home through birth, adoption, or foster care. It does also, in the case of adoption and foster care, apply to pre-placement activities or pre-adoption activities. Um, both mothers and fathers may take bonding leave, and it can be taken at any time within the first 12 months of the child's life or placement in the home. Caregiver leave refers to leave that a uh, employee might take to care for someone in their family who's experiencing a serious health condition. We also have family violence leave. So family violence leave can be taken by someone who's experiencing family violence and who needs to, for example, seek medical care or counseling, obtain services from a victim service organization, relocate or attend court proceedings. Um, for family violence leave, the allowance is up to 12 days in a 12, uh, excuse me, in a calendar year. And then finally, we have two types of leave that apply to the military. The first is qualifying exigency leave, and that is leave uh, that can be taken by an employee whose spouse, child, or parent is on federal active duty or who has been notified of an impending call to duty. And that would allow them to address certain issues that, um, that might be impacted by that spouse, uh, child, or parent's deployment. So for example, perhaps they need to go to a lawyer and take care of getting their will in order or um, financial concerns. Those are things that might qualify um, for, for qualifying exigency leave. And then lastly, military caregiver leave, which is taken to care for a military member who was injured in active duty in the armed forces. So for caregiver leave, we do want to um, make a special note because under the Connecticut law, someone can take caregiver leave for a parent, a spouse, a son or daughter of any age, a sibling, a grandparent, a grandchild, or an individual related to the employee by blood or affinity. Let's talk about what that means, related by affinity. So um, any person with whom the employee has a significant personal bond that is like one of the family relations, excuse me, relationships listed in the statute, which I had just uh, named off, regardless of biological or legal relationship. The determination of related by affinity is situation specific, but here are a couple of examples. The first would be if there's an aunt or uncle who relies on the employee for unpaid care and they have a relationship with that employee like you would see between a parent and a child. That could be considered relationship by affinity. Another example that is um, possibly more common would be an unmarried but significant other of the employee with whom the employee shares a family-like relationship. So perhaps they own a home together, they share the household bills, they may have children together but they're not married. So legally they have no relationship to one another. That is relationship by affinity as well. Let's take a look at the eligibility requirements, um, not only for Connecticut FMLA and Connecticut paid leave, but also for federal FMLA, which is a consideration as well. 
So for federal FMLA, job protected leave, an employee must be employed by their employer for at least 12 months and must have worked for at least 1,250 hours in the 12 months immediately preceding their leave. Connecticut FMLA, which we reviewed already um, starting in January, they need the employee needs to be employed for at least three months, but there will no longer be an hour's work requirement. And then to be eligible for Connecticut paid leave benefits, the employee needs to have earned at least $2,325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the past five quarters. That can be from one or more employers. So if there's a part, uh, part-time employee who works two or three part-time jobs, as long as their total earnings from those employers and as long as those employers are all covered, add up to the 2325, that employee would meet the earning requirement. And then additionally, um, the employee needs to either be currently employed and working in Connecticut with a covered employer or had been employed and working in Connecticut during the 12 weeks immediately before their leave. And again, if it is a sole proprietor or a self-employed individual, they must have opted into the program. And in that case, they must also be residing in Connecticut. So how long can someone take um, either job protected leave or for how long can they receive benefits under Connecticut paid leave? With federal FMLA, which applies to employers with 50 or more employees, it's up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period with the exception of military caregiver leave being 26 weeks in a 12 month period. Under Connecticut FMLA starting in January, it's up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period. So same as federal and the military caregiver leave also um, mimics the federal leave with 26 weeks. Then as I mentioned previously, there's up to 12 days in a calendar year that can be used for family violence leave pursuant to the Family Violence Leave Act and an employee who is incapacitated during pregnancy may be additional, uh, of it, excuse me, may be um, able to receive an additional two weeks. For Connecticut paid leave income replacement benefits, up to 12 weeks are available in a 12 month period for all um, reasons, including military caregiver leave. So if someone is taking military caregiver leave, they would be possibly eligible for up to 26 weeks of job protection but only 12 of those weeks would be eligible for income replacement under Connecticut paid leave. Um, Connecticut paid leave will also provide up to 12 days in a, um, of the 12 weeks in a calendar year for uh, family violence leave. And that additional two weeks for incapacitation during pregnancy is also available under Connecticut paid leave. Lastly, let's just take a quick look at some of the different laws that provide job protected leave and income replacement. So we went over federal FMLA and Connecticut FMLA. Again, federal FMLA um, is not changing and that applies to businesses with 50 or more employees. Connecticut FMLA starting in January will apply to businesses with one or more employees. There's also workers' compensation, which is available for covered on the job illness or injury and that does provide job protection. And then there are a few different laws, um, including the Americans with Disabilities Act, which applies to businesses with 15 or more employees, the Pregnancy Disabilities Act, also 15 or more employees, and the Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act, three or more employees. And all three of these laws state that leave may be considered a reasonable accommodation. So those should also be considered. As far as laws that provide income replacement, besides Connecticut paid leave, uh, there's also, of course, workers' compensation, which in addition to providing job protection also provides income replacement. So now I'd like to ask Kathy to take over and she's gonna talk a bit about implementing the Connecticut Paid Leave Act. Thank you, Jessica. Welcome everyone. Um, just as a recap as to what Jessica had said earlier regarding Connecticut paid leave contributions, as you know, effective 1121, workers were contributing half a percent of their FICA wages up to the Social Security contribution limit. The employer had to create a Connecticut paid leave account. They had to register with the Connecticut paid leave, deduct the half a percent of employees' FICA wages, and then remit the contributions to Connecticut paid leave with the required backup information. And as Jessica had um, referenced earlier, these uh, contributions were submitted on a quarterly basis. The Connecticut Paid Leave Authority would then reconcile and receive the contributions, process for any over or under payments, and impose penalties for any noncompliance. 
Connecticut Department of Labor will de- would be the per- one to determine whether to allow employers to make any catch-up contributions. Next, uh, Connecticut paid leave claims. The worker is required to submit the application in a timely fashion. 30 days prior to when the employer, employee or worker is required to take the leave is when we ask workers to submit their applications. This allows time for the employee or worker to create their Connecticut paid leave account online on the Connecticut paid leave website, provide any supporting documentation for their claim. Now, when an employee goes to the Connecticut paid leave site and sets up their personal account, if they are ready to submit a claim, a button will pop up and take them to the AFLAC portal. AFLAC is our TPA for processing claims. While they are on the AFLAC portal submitting their request for a a claim, they will be asked to support to provide supporting documentation and update their account with any absence information or any sources of income. Most importantly, workers or employees are required to notify employers about CTPL claim. That is that the worker should be notifying their employer that they did file the claim and that they are taking a leave. As part of the process, the employer will be required to complete and submit what is called an employment verification form. This form is part of the welcome packet that the worker receives. The worker completes the top portion of the form and then will submit it to the employer for further completion. The employer is required to put in the uh, company name, the address, a phone number and email address of a contact person in case there are any questions regarding this claim. In addition, as the uh, part of the employment verification form, there are questions about hours worked and the employee's schedule. It is the employee's responsibility to notify the worker about any PTO policies, including short-term disability policies. AFLAC will determine eligibility once they have all the supporting documents and they will approve or deny claims as appropriate. AFLAC is responsible for calculating and paying benefits. They monitor the ongoing claims and assess requests for reconsideration. What reconsideration means is let's say someone submits a claim and the claim is denied. The employee can go back to AFLAC and say, I'd like to have my claim reconsidered because here are the reasons why I submitted my claim late or I didn't have the proper documentation. So that's built into the process. AFLAC will also investigate potential fraud and impose penalties as appropriate. If a claim is denied, the employee has the option to appeal that denial. The employee will receive information by um, email or letter, whatever they selected as part of the online uh, setting up of their account. If an employee decides to appeal a denial, it is completed through the Connecticut Department of Labor. Income replacement benefits the process. Just as a quick review, the worker submits the claim online, but first they need to create account with Connecticut Paid Leave. As part of the claim process, they need to submit their supporting documentation, including information about a reason for the claim, the length of the leave, the type of leave, where they work, and other sources of income. AFLAC would then determine their eligibility based on DOL data and also based on a completed employment verification form. Then AFLAC determines if the claim is approved. AFLAC reviews the documentation and notifies the worker if any documentation is missing. And again, if a claim is denied, AFLAC does notify the worker with information to request uh, the right to request reconsideration. When AFLAC calculates the benefits, it uses Department of Labor data and other sources of info as necessary to calculate the base weekly earnings. 
Aflac calculates the weekly benefits taking into consideration the type of leave and offsets for other income. Aflac issues benefit payments. Now, as a reminder, 12121, employees are eligible to go online and they could submit their claim for effective for 1122. Claims processed or submitted in December of 21 will not be paid until July, or July, listen to me, January 1, 22. Benefit payments are issued each Tuesday, two weeks in arrears. For example, let's say someone um, was out on leave from 1222 through 1822. Their first payment will be issued on 11822. The worker is responsible for notifying AFLAC of any changes. For example, if the start or end date of their leave changed, if they have other income, if the worker's taking intermittent leave, they need to provide frequent updates to AFLAC about leave usage. So here's an example of a formula for paid leave benefits. In column one, if the worker's base earnings are less than or equal to the minimum wage, the weekly paid benefit will be 95% of the covered worker's base earnings. The current minimum wage is $13 an hour. So if someone is working 40 hours a week earning minimum wage, their benefit would be 40 times 13, which is $520. If a worker's base weekly earnings are more than the minimum wage, this example is in column two, the weekly benefit rate is calculated a little differently. 40 times the minimum, 95% of 40 times the minimum wage plus 60% of the worker's base earnings, Connecticut minimum wage multiplied by 40. The total weekly benefit payment is capped at 60 times the Connecticut minimum wage. So the total maximum paid benefit is 60 times 13, which is $780 a week. This is example um, is a little bit easier to understand. Um, worker A earns minimum wage. As we mentioned in the previous slide, they work 40 hours a week at $13 an hour. Their benefit um, is 40 times 13 is the $520 a week. The benefit is multiplied by 95%, which gives us $494. So worker A receives $494 in benefits. Worker B earns above the minimum wage. So we would take the 40 hours at $13.50 an hour, which gives us $540 weekly. 95% of that benefit plus 60% gives us $506. Worker B receives $506 in benefits. Now, the easy part is that on our Connecticut paid leave site, there is a benefits estimator. This would be at the header. There is a header, a blue header at the top of the first page. It is called the process, and once you click on that, the next heading down is prepare to submit a claim. Here is where employees can go and do an estimation for their benefits. So this is a lot easier than trying to manually calculate it out. The information was provided so that you understand how benefits are calculated. However, the estimator is also a tool that you can use. So the process is a bit easier for everyone. Coordinating Connecticut paid leave benefits and employer provided PTO. We have four scenarios listed here, which are quite uh, useful when looking at someone's PTO. Scenario one, a worker has no PTO to use. So if an employee slash worker has no PTO, then they receive the full amount of Connecticut paid leave for the full period of the leave. Scenario two, the worker has enough PTO to cover the entire leave. So no CTPL benefits would be paid to the worker. 
Scenario three, the worker has PTL to cover part of the leave. So let's say the CTPL benefits start after the PTL benefits are exhausted from the employer, minus the two weeks employees are entitled to keep effective 1122. Scenario four, PTO is less than the worker's regular pay. Worker gets a benefit at the start of the leave and employers can coordinate the benefits to make up any wage differences. A key note to remember is that in all instances, employees get no more than 100% of their regular pay. So what do your workers need to know? If, you, if an employee approaches you about going on the leave, Connecticut paid leave, you will need to let them know about their employer provided paid time off while on leave. Secondly, if there are any rules about using such time. Thirdly, if you offer a short-term disability policy, I would recommend reviewing the policy to see if there are any statements that the policy, the policy states that the worker must exhaust other employer provided PTO and CTPL benefits before accessing the short-term disability payments. This depends on the short-term disability policy, and I highly recommend that you review your policy prior to 12-1-21. Implementing Connecticut FMLA claims. Now this is Connecticut FMLA. This is not Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. The worker notifies the employer about the need to take time away from work. They submit the application, provide the employer with supporting documentation, and complies with employer attendance and call-in policies. The employer is required to establish leave policy rules about PTO usage, process leave requests, and monitor leave usage, manage worker return to work. The Connecticut Paid Leave Authority has no official responsibilities related to Connecticut FMLA. However, we do provide information about Connecticut FMLA as part of the Connecticut Paid Leave Training. Connecticut Department of Labor once again provides guidance to workers and employers about Connecticut FMLA. They will investigate complaints or denials of Connecticut FMLA claims and discrimination and or retaliation. Job protected leave process. The worker notifies the employer they need time off. The worker does not need to use the term FMLA. 30 days in advance if the need is foreseeable and as soon as practical if the need for the leave is not foreseeable, such as in the case of an emergency. The employer determines if the worker is eligible for Connecticut FMLA and notifies the worker if they need to provide any additional documents. The employer has five business days to notify the worker of eligibility and provides the notice of rights and responsibilities. This is not the leave approval. The worker provides the required documentation, medical certification, adoption documents, military records, and the worker has 15 days to provide such documentation to their employer. If the worker notifies the employer of difficulty in obtaining the documents, the employer should give the worker additional time. The employer notifies the worker if the leave is approved under Connecticut FMLA. Again, the employer has five business days once it received the required documentation for the leave request. Employer also notifies the worker if they're required to use paid leave accruals, how and when the worker needs to report in, and if the worker will need to provide a fitness for duty before returning to work. The worker reports to the employer when the worker actually takes leave. It is the employer's responsibility to track leave usage to ensure the worker does not exceed the 12 weeks. The employer returns the worker to the job the worker held before the leave. The worker has the right to the same, the right to return to the same job with the same terms and conditions. 
the employer cannot insist that the employee be 100% fit for duty or totally recovered. Employer must consider ADA and CFEPA obligations. Complicating factors for managing FMLA. Managing worker absences, enforcing attendance or call-in policies, getting timely notices from workers or supervisors. Managing intermittent leave due to unforeseen circumstances. An employee can come up to you and say, I need to have two or three hours of intermittent leave this afternoon. Calculating the average work week for workers who work fluctuating work weeks. Incomplete insufficient medical certifications and managing the interaction between Connecticut FMLA, federal FMLA, and other laws. In all circumstances, it is the employer's right and responsibility to designate time off that qualifies under FMLA as FMLA leave, even if the worker does not ask for it. Thank you, Kathy. So we want to leave you with some additional resources where you can gather more information. Our website is a great source of information. And on the website, you can find these two uh, documents, the Employer Toolkit and the Human Resources Toolkit. They can both be downloaded. And they have a lot of this information that we've talked about, as well as some other um, useful and helpful tips. We also have several pieces that are already put together, which you can share with your employees. So we have, for example, an employee fact sheet, a rack card, an employee rights poster. And if you do have additional questions, um, there, there are also probably a couple hundred frequently asked questions on our website. On our YouTube page, we have several videos that can be really useful, um, both for yourselves as um, employers administering the program and for employees to answer questions that may come up. And then lastly, we do not have a call center um, just because it, it is pretty prohibitively expensive, but we do have a contact us portal. And so if you do have questions, we would ask that you write in through the contact us portal in your submission. If you would prefer that someone give you a phone call back as opposed to communicating through email, um, we do have the option for you to indicate that and then someone will call you back to talk through um, that issue and get it resolved for you. So we thank you so much for taking the time. We know that it's a, a, a busy, busy time of year for everyone. Um, so we really appreciate it. At this time, we'd like to answer any questions that we may not have addressed in the presentation. Thank you. Hi, ladies. So I've been tackling down some of the questions in our QA. Um, we do have one right now coming from Rachel and it says, what happens if an employee takes FMLA in November or December? Are they still able to take the 16 weeks that's currently available or would they need to return in 12 weeks due to the change starting in January, 2022? Kathy, would you like to address that one? Um, if that's the FMLA, they'll need to contact um, the Department of Labor as they handle the Federal Medical Leave Act. So for more information, I would suggest contacting the DOL either on their website or through their 1-800 number. And I will drop the link to the Connecticut DOL's website for FMLA in the Perfect. chat now for everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. Great. And can we speak at, as far as to what penalties for physicians uh, who falsify med certs, either for FMLA or PFML? There are penalties that will be imposed on physicians that um, falsify if it is found that, you know, they have falsified medical cert information. It will be both financial and there may be other penalties as far as, um, well, I think that's still being developed with legal because, you know, we can't prevent physicians from, you know, filling out forms. However, I know that for a fact there is a financial penalty right now for physicians who complete the forms incorrectly or fraudulently. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. All right. Does anyone else have any questions? We do have some time. We'd like to make sure that we get to everyone's questions. Here's another one from Sandy. I keep 
emailing a question and always got an error message. Sandy, can you please drop your email in the chat for me and I will reach out to you. Um, can you please speak on how Connecticut paid leave entitlement and FMLA can run concurrently and how they're coordinated? Kathy, do you want to address um, that or would you like well, me Well, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, first, you would have to look at your pay time off policy to see how the person, um, you know, if there are any benefits for PT, whatever your policy is for PTO, sick time. And again, for 1122 for CT, FMLA, you have to keep two weeks of their time for the new year. So how it's it would run concurrently. So if they were approved for family medical leave and say they were approved for 1122, they have job protection under FMLA and under Connecticut paid leave, they would have income replacement. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Our next question, if an employee applies for short-term disability and is approved and they get more from their short-term disability plan, from the Connecticut paid leave plan, does that mean that they're not eligible for Connecticut paid leave? No, it doesn't mean that they're not eligible. They just cannot receive more than 100% of their normal wages. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. All right, just wait a moment and see if anybody else has any other questions. While we're waiting, I am going to drop a um, link in the chat to our website, mm -hmm. calendar of events, where we do have several other topics we've been discussing. Um, our webinars are free, so please feel free to share this information with your colleagues and coworkers. And um, if anybody wants to join us on any other webinars, we can do that. Um, thank you for sending me your email, Sandy. I will reach out to you. Um, how will the employer know if an employee is getting Connecticut paid leave benefits? Once the employee has been approved for Connecticut paid leave benefits, an email will be sent to the employer, letting them know that the employee's CTPL leave was approved, the dates, the start and end date, and the weekly benefit amount. That's why it's so important on the employment verification form that you receive from the employee that we have your correct email address, phone number, and that you complete the wage information, not the wage, sorry, the schedule information for the employee. Thank you. And does an employee have to use their PTO time up before they can receive Connecticut Bay leave? The PTO, policy is dependent on the employer. It doesn't depend on Connecticut paid leave. It depends on what your policy is for employees. Thank you, Kathy. Again, just to add, as we mentioned, um, you will have to allow, regardless of what your policy is, you will have to allow an employee to retain up to two weeks of PTO starting in January. So if your policy does stipulate that they need to use their leave, just keep that in mind. Thank you, Jess. And we just got a question in the chat asking if uh, Connecticut paid leave payments will have taxes withheld. The answer to that question is yes. That is yes. And when the employee, I see there was another part of the question, like how was that determined? When the employee goes online to the um, AFLAC portal and they complete all that information, the tax information will be included in their welcome kit and they need to fill out the tax form for that benefit. You can. Um, another here is if our employees, let's see, I'm trying to understand your question. Bear with me for just a second. Is the employee's use of Connecticut paid leave entitlement counted against their FMLA? If so, how is that coordinated? They really are they're two separate things. So um, we at the Paid Leave Authority are responsible for the paid leave portion of it, but you as the employer are responsible for working with the employee to determine um, their job protection. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though if someone is receiving Connecticut paid leave, they're automatically also getting FMLA or vice versa. They really have to be um, treated as the two separate laws that they are. So 
uh, just receiving Connecticut paid leave does not count against FMLA. Um, but if someone is receiving FM, uh, excuse me, paid leave benefits, the chances are that they are probably out for a reason that would also qualify them for job protection. And so you as the employer would need to coordinate that with them. So Edward, the employee would have to apply for both FMLA and Connecticut paid leave in this example. Thank you, ladies. Um, we have a question in the chat I would like to share. Um, many employers require all PTO be used each year. We now required to let employees keep two weeks. As of 1-1-2020, Connecticut Family Medical Leave is required, requiring employers to hold, to have two weeks of empl employees' PTO time in their bank, effective 1-1-2022. One, one, okay. And will the Department of Labor be providing webinars on the changes in Connecticut FMLA since those questions are not being addressed here? So you would need to reach out to the Connecticut DOL. I'll drop that mm -hmm. link in the chat one more time for you. Um, you would need to coordinate with them. So Connecticut paid leave, just to reiterate, uh, we, we basically handle the income replacement, whereas DOL would be handling the job protection, which is the FMLA you're asking about. So I've just um, I've just submitted a link again to the DOL FMLA site. So you can go there and, uh, and ask for information on that. I'm not sure if they're offering webinars or not. Um, how long do we have to allow the employee to keep two weeks of PTO? Um, until further notice. I mean, the law goes into effect one, one, what do you mean as far as you keep the two weeks of PTO? Like, I think this might stem back to those employers and Lonnie, please feel free to, um, to correct me. But as of January one, one, there are some employers that require everyone to use their pay time off, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what she's asking is if that bank is replenished every year, they get mm -hmm. to continue to keep those two weeks every year. Yes, year to year until the law, if the law decides to change, I mean, this is a new law in effect for 1-1-22 for Connecticut FMLA. Okay, but to clear, they're not gonna get to keep two weeks and then it would be four weeks and then it would be six weeks. It's just as long as they have two weeks saved per year. Yes, for example, if someone has say three weeks of PTO one one twenty two, and they go out on leave, the law requires that the employer has to keep two weeks of their bank. So they would then be able to use only one week of their PTO towards their leave. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know that can get tricky sometimes. It gets, some, it's going to be tricky for employers. It's a lot of coordinating and a lot of um, documentation. Yeah. There's another question here. Can the employee choose to use their PTO towards leave? Um, so we've actually had this question asked quite a lot. And yes, an employee can choose to use their PTO towards their leave, but but A, I mean, why would they want to? B, if you're going to allow your employees to do that, definitely get it in writing. Um, and the next question is, if an employee used all their PTO prior to leave, well, if they don't have any, then there isn't anything left to retain. So they would just go through and apply to Connecticut paid leave. Right. And can people use their PTO to cover the waiting period? Yes. Is that correct, Kathy? They can use their PTO to cover the waiting period with the same stipulation as before? Well, what do they mean by wait? There is no waiting period. I mean, are you talk? what is they referring to when they say waiting period for PTO? I believe that is the waiting period from when a person applies to when they are approved and would receive benefits back well, to the date that they had applied. What happens is someone would apply for CTPL 30 days before they go out on the leave. So say if someone applies in December of 21 and they're approved for 1-1, are you talking about, when you say waiting period, are you referring to the time that they receive their first benefit payment? John, would you mind reiterating your question?
We're going to hold on that for just a moment, Kathy. Okay. Um, we allow employees to voluntarily hold vacation time PTO if they have time available. We don't require them. I'm trying to understand this question. Edward, I'm going to ask you to come on live, if you don't mind. Don, I'll do the same with you as well so that you can ask your question because I don't want to botch your question. <laughs> All right, Edward. Yes, hi. Um, yeah, so we allow employees to hold vacation time if they have available, if they have time available. So um, just want to make sure I understand you correctly when you say they, you know, we're required to, to hold time. Uh, maybe I just misunderstood you. Can you clarify that? Okay, now just keep in mind, Edward, Connecticut FMLA is different than Connecticut paid leave. The Connecticut FMLA program is requiring 1122 that employers hold two weeks of PTO time, effective 1122. So two weeks of PTO in their bank. So if, if I could just add to that um, a bit, Kathy, essentially, uh -huh. essentially the, the reasoning behind this is that, um, you know, someone goes out and they have a serious, you know, surgery or something like that. They had, you know, four weeks of PTO saved up or six weeks and they have to exhaust all of that. And then they have to miss out on things that they were saving that for, such as, uh -huh. you know, a wedding or the trip of a lifetime that they plan to Italy or something like that. And so that's the whole reasoning um, behind this is, is not to make people um, exhaust all their time to cover their, their leave in order to receive payment so that if they do have these other, you know, big, exciting life events coming up, they're still able to attend them. So it's not that it's two weeks that needs to be held for everybody in rollover year to year. It's just that if they are going out and they have enough time to cover their whole leave and they don't want to use it, you have to you have to say it's okay for you to save two weeks for use at a later point. I hope that that makes it a little more clear. And if someone doesn't have two weeks to hold, what happens then? Then, then they just can apply directly to Connecticut paid leave because they don't um, they they can't hold on to something that that they don't have. So. They don't have right. Did we answer Dawn's question? I want to make sure that we don't leave that um, unaddressed. Okay. okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Dawn. All right. Well, we are right at about just about two o'clock. So thank you so much for your attention. Again, we know that there's there's a lot and mm -hmm. you know, we know that it's it's a little difficult too since we are only responsible for the income replacement portion of it um but again please do look at our website it has a lot of information mm -hmm. and um if you do send a question through our contact us portal they uh the the folks there will get back to you within maybe two business days at the most thank you so much jess thank you everyone for joining us have a great day all right thank, thank you, you everyone. everyone bye